So welcome to our session on epidemiology. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to us our plenary speaker, Dr. Simon Moore. Professor Moore is <coughs> professor of epidemiology and risk analysis at, here at the University College of Dublin in, in Ireland. He's also director of the UCD Center for Veterinary Epidemiology and Risk Analysis. And oftentimes in, in epidemiology, it is, it is difficult to apply our thoughts. To veterinarians have difficulty in, in applying their thoughts or translating their thoughts around individual animal diagnosis to the concept of a herd. And the epidemiologi epidemiologic tools are very useful for this. So could we just welcome Professor Moore as he shares with us a perspective and an approach of how we can move from the individual animal to the herd. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to speak this afternoon. Uh, in this presentation, I wanted to particularly acknowledge my two co-authors, uh, Michael Doherty and, and Luke O'Grady, who uh, the three of us uh, essentially plotted this talk together. Now, what I wanted to focus on this afternoon was essentially the art of diagnosis, the approaches that are, ta uh, that are taken to diagnosis. I'll mention very briefly investigating individual cases, but what I really wanted to do was to talk about herd problem solving and focus initially on the translation of the approaches we'd use in an individual across to a herd to highlight some of the difficulties that we face in doing that and then the real added value that epidemiological principles and methods can help us with. So the, the bottom line, I guess, of the talk at the very beginning is that I would suggest that these additional tools are extremely valuable, but they're also readily applicable in the field. And the whole area of diagnosis is clearly a really important one. In, in fact, it's really the, the, the central tenet of, of clinical veterinary medicine. It allows us to make diagnoses, to recognise diseases, guides the therapeutic choices that we make and also helps in terms of communication. So this whole issue of diagnostic approaches is clearly really important. So in terms of investigating individual cases, imagine you're presented with this case, a recumbent cow, uh, she's a Frisian, a second carver, two days after an uneventful carving, and she's been found like this, unable to rise, relatively bright, alert and responsive. Based on the, the really excellent talk from uh, our Australian colleague, uh, Phil Poulton, yesterday, I think uh, uh, um, you, you, it's obviously something that you folks have been able to think about in some detail. But in terms of the diagnostic approaches that are used, one of the most common, certainly amongst experienced practitioners, is pattern recognition. We've seen this before and therefore this is another case of the same thing. Or if we're not quite sure, we then start to pull out a list of differential diagnoses. And uh, in this case, the animal's just been found, so we're probably primarily interested in these primary causes, although Phil quite correctly highlighted the real concern of secondary causes after 24 hours. So they're perhaps the two most common methods of, uh, of diagnostic approaches that are used. But with students within the uh, School of Veterinary Medicine at UCD here in Dublin, we really focus on a third method. And uh, in the textbooks, it's called key abnormality, but we essentially talk about it as structure and function. And we work very hard in terms of students understanding the whole act of rising what things are involved, what systems are involved in getting a cow up uh, when, she's, when she's approached. The role of the eye, the various components of the ner nervous system through to the musculoskeletal system. And this is the type of approach that our students would take. Firstly, a, a very sound understanding of structure and function relevant to recumbency, then ascertaining history and signalment, a general clinical, which is extended to neurological and musculoskeletal, if relevant, uh, 
and then uh, those clues are used in terms of considering and ranking differentials. And I think uh, we can see the value of it in a case that I'm just about to show you. But the reason that we focus on this is we're very keen that the students have a deep understanding of facts, but also of concepts, of processes, procedures and principles. So very much focusing on the questions of what and how to understand the why. And as I mentioned, with this second case, perhaps we can see the value of uh, this really sound understanding of structure and function. Uh, a Charolais cross calf, normal at birth and is currently 10 weeks of age. It's bright, it's alert, responsive, it, but with an insidious onset over the last seven to 10 days, it has, now has difficulty rising and is recumbent. In the clinical exam, I have a video which I'll show you, but the clinical exam highlights bilateral spasticity in the hind limbs uh, and the likely etiology of an upper motor neuron uh, lesion and most likely an abscess rather than a, a, a fracture or a, clearly rather than a tumour. And so the video is this and it's quite short and it really highlights uh, each of these points and also the value of this structure and function approach in terms of diagnosis. So we can see the spasticity in the hind limbs. Uh, substantial muscle tone. Seeking to localise the lesion. On radiography, uh, reduced intervertebral space between L2 and L3. And uh, as you would expect, uh, an early demise and uh, an abscess um, and caused by uh, the, the organism isolated with Salmonella Dublin. So it's really just to show um, why we find this particular approach particularly useful. But what I'd like to do now is to shift from the individual through to the herd. And uh, our experience, again, uh, within uh, uh, the university is that, certainly for students, but we would suggest also for practitioners as well, that uh, there's a direct translation of these approaches from the individual to the herd. And the two key approaches that we would commonly see, firstly, and it's a little bit like pattern recognition, where it's essentially comparison with best practice. And, and so what we would find is that, that uh, students, particularly students, but also veterinarians, would undertake, for example, with a, a mastitis problem, what perhaps we could consider as a mastitis audit. And so comparison with best practice, looking, for example, at milking routine, at cow behaviour, at teeth disinfection, and most importantly, comparing what we find with what we consider to be best practice or in terms of the differential, and, and clearly there's mixing between the two um, milk cultures and using that to really identify the organism and then placing a label on it. And so uh, our students, in terms of what rapidly turns into an audit, would have a very clear understanding of milking routine, of milking machine function, of teat disinfection, and of sampling, for example. And, and then cultures would be done. So this is really a direct translation of the skills from the individual through to uh, the herd in terms of herd problem solving. But we've found in our experience there's problems with this approach. And the key problems, firstly, if it's done properly, is it takes a long time because there's lots of components to the audit. The second thing is that my perception of best practice will be very different to the perception from another clinician. And therefore, our, our, our areas where we think there's work to be done on the farm will vary. Our to-do list will vary between who, uh, depending on who's investigating the issue. And then lastly, 
and perhaps most importantly of all, we have this long to-do list, but how do we prioritise? How do we prioritise? Noting that what we want to do is to focus on those components of the list that if they were addressed would make the greatest difference to the mastitis problem. So do we suggest a fix everything approach or do we prioritise and, and many of our farmers, perhaps all of them would say, well, what's the cheapest? And we'll work with that, but without any guarantees that the cheapest is actually going to address the problem at hand. And then the differential diagnosis approach has problems as well, obviously very useful in simple cases, but we don't always uh, focus on simple cases. So we would suggest, Michael, Luke, myself, because farms are complex places, and we'd all agree with that, um, that perhaps this direct translation is problematic in many circumstances. It's certainly a collection of individuals, individual cows, but there's these additional layers of environment, management, feeding, etc., which are also very important. And there, for those reasons, uh, we'd contend, and, and I would suggest that many vets in the room would utilise these approaches anyway, we would contend that introducing epidemiological principles and methods is extremely useful. I suspect that many, many uh, people may think of epidemiology a little bit like this. And it's complex, but in fact, certainly that's a useful tool, but in my view, epidemiology for the bovine practitioner is all about principles and methods, a way of thinking that can help us to make sense of complexity in animal populations, including herds. And so it's obviously an additional tool that potentially is very useful. And to illustrate uh, this epidemiological thinking, I'd like to give you an example, and I suspect it's an example that many of you already know, and it's not from the area of cattle, but rather it's the first uh, well-documented uh, use of epidemiology to solve problems. And you'll recognise it, I'm sure. So over 180 years ago, there was outbreaks of cholera, uh, a large outbreak of cholera that occurred in London. And uh, that was understandable given at that time, uh, the, the uh, United Kingdom, uh, the, the sun genuinely didn't set on the United Kingdom and there was this trade of, of all sorts of things, including movement of people, in this case, from the Indian uh, colonies through the Cape colonies and up into the UK. And at that point in time and subsequently, cholera was an ongoing problem uh, in, uh, in, in, in India. So in London in 1832, there was a major outbreak. 11,000 cases and half of those people died. The important thing to be aware of is that this outbreak occurred about 30 years before people had any idea about the concept of germs. It was 30 years before Vibrio cholerae was identified by Louis Pasteur. And this fellow called John Snow um, is, is really credited as the first epidemiologist internationally, started to draw maps. And these are the maps that he drew of the cholera outbreak at the time. So if I just enlarge that, and if I just enlarge that a little bit further, the key thing that we'll note is that uh, what he did is he drew a line for every person that died in a household. So all we have is the numerator information. We don't have denominator. So we know all the people that died, but we don't know um, how many people lived in that area. But if we assume that it was a fairly even distribution and that there were as many people living in this house as there were perhaps in this house here, the key thing that uh, John Snow identified was clustering in space. The fact that cases are much more common here than they are out here. And if we were to expand the map further, it would be even more distinct. So spatial clustering. And at that time, the, if I just go back, at that time, um, the key thing was that water was not reticulated. So people had to go to pumps to get water. And John Snow was particularly concerned about this particular pump here and felt that the pattern that he observed 
offered clues as to what was going on and the key thing that was at the centre of that spatial cluster was that pump. So what he did was uh, he investigated the, uh, the supply system in greater detail in London. It was a privatised system. Different companies supplied different pumps and his interest was particularly in this company here and uh, it's the one that supplies the green here uh, because that was the company that supplied water to the, what was known as the Broad Street Pump. And on the basis of that, and only on the basis of that information, he was able to persuade the authorities to take the pump ha handle away. And the number of cases fell dramatically, although John Snow quite correctly suggests, and I'll show you what he said at the time, he said, there is no doubt that the mortality was much diminished, as I said before, by the flight of the population, which commenced soon after the outbreak. So people had left, as you would expect. But the attacks had so far diminished before the use of the water was stopped that it's impossible to decide whether the well still contained the cholera poison in an active state or whether by some, from some cause the water had become free from it. So there is some debate about whether removing that pump uh, did the trick or whether the, the fall had occurred previously. If we look now in 21st century eyes, this is in fact what happened. So we've got the River Thames through London flowing in this direction here. We've got these two water companies. This is the company here that supplied the Broad Street pump and the number of cases per 100,000 population was about 10 times higher than it is for the other companies. And the key thing is that London's main sewerage outlet was actually upstream from where that company was drawing water, which clearly in our eyes is outrageous, but people didn't know that at the time. But these are pictures of landscape at that point and you can imagine that the water wasn't particularly clean. Okay, so, so the key thing, the key principle of epidemiology that's important in, in, in practice, that's important in any setting, I think, is that we're based, we do our work based on the assumption that disease does not occur randomly. And therefore, if there are patterns that can provide clues to help us to understand why. So the key words here are patterns and clues. And the patterns that we're really interested in are patterns in different dimensions whether they're in time, whether they're between different animal groupings, or potentially whether they're in space. And so what John Snow had done is he'd identified patterns, patterns in space. They gave him clues about potential disease causation, and that provided the opportunity for him to undertake effective disease control. Okay, now moving back to cattle, what does this all mean? How can we best use this in the context of a herd investigation? There's two key principles that I'd like to, to, to highlight that are, I think are really useful and really important in terms of utilising these epidemiological principles and methods. The first one is we're interested in patterns and we're interested in patterns, if possible, in those three dimensions. Patterns in space can be difficult in small farms. Uh, in large farms or farms with fragments, of course, they can be much more useful. But we're interested in asking these particular questions. And the key thing is, th if I just go, sorry, if I just go back, in time we're interested in when did cases occur and we're al also interested in whether cases occurred at particular points in time. In space, we're interested in where cases occur and whether they occur in different places. And among different groups, we want to know which. Were they young, were they old, were they male, were they female, were they early lactation, were they late, etc. And the key thing is, this complements our other skills, the ones that we pull across from individual uh, animal cases. Previously, we were really, oops, sorry, we were really interested in the, the what and the how, we now have additional tools in our armory that can help to understand the why. The second key principle is the need for us to clearly distinguish performance from activity. And what I mean by that is 
from an epidemiological point of view, our key interest is in performance. We want to know what is being achieved on the farm. And we want to make sure we don't confuse that with activity, which is what is being done. And I'll give you several examples. If we were to use lameness, if we were to use lameness as an example, then performance relates essentially to the, locomo the average locomotion score on this farm or something like that. It's a quantitative measure about what has been achieved to this point in time. In contrast, activity relates to whether a farmer uses foot bathing, whether a farmer has a routine process of uh, hoof trimming, what's the state of the laneways, whether the farmer uses a dog. So they're activities, they're things that are done, but from an epidemiological perspective, our initial focus is very much on what's achieved. So, so within uh, the, the veterinary school here in Dublin, what we propose is that the normal herd investigation, steps two, steps three, and steps four, are preceded by a very careful epidemiological understanding about what's going on. Where what we are doing is focusing on performance and using that to say, are there patterns? Do those patterns provide clues? And what plausible hypotheses can we develop on the basis of the patterns and the clues that we see? And if there are, if there are plausible hypotheses, then that very rapidly focuses the rest of our investigation. So just a couple of comments, and I have a case study which I'll come to in a moment. A couple of comments about this step one. We'd see it in three parts. The first part is essentially building the epidemiological framework. And it's not complex at all, but firstly, we need to be very clear about what the problem is, and we need to define that in terms of performance. Secondly, we need to create a case definition and the reason for that is that epidemiology, it is a numeric discipline, so we need to be able to have some numbers, not as complex as the formula I showed you previously, so that we can place cows that meet the case definition in this bucket and cows that don't meet the case definition in this bucket here. And we want our case definition to be as good as possible but obviously pragmatic, but as good as possible so we don't get too much misclassification. We don't want to put our non-cases into the case bucket if we, can afford, if we can avoid it, and we don't want to put our cases into the non-case bucket. Once we've got that, then the next step is essentially to create simple measures of case frequency, and to do that according to those three dimensions uh, that I mentioned before. Once we have that, it's then a matter of saying, well, what patterns can we see in each of those dimensions? And then, given that we do have patterns, what hypotheses are plausible? Given two things, one is the patterns that we see, but also a sound understanding of the biological processes, which we all clearly have. And so, for example, with respect to mastitis, I personally find this particular uh, graphic um, from um, Dairy Australia, produced a long time ago, is extremely helpful in terms of understanding the dynamics of an infectious uh, mastitic organism. So to come to a case and using these principles, hopefully, to, uh, to illustrate the point that I'm trying to make. So this is a case, an ongoing milk quality concerns, a predominantly spring calving, but not entirely, because it had fertility problems as well, predominantly spring calving dairy herd in Ireland. And it was a herd that several years ago had been an amalgamation from two other herds of older cows and young heifers.
In terms of building the framework, uh, firstly defining the problem in terms of performance, obviously that relates to cell count and we've got a, a high bulk cell count uh, uh, and that's been high for a, an extended period of time. In terms of the case definition, remembering what we're wanting to do is to, figuratively speaking, put cows into different buckets. We're essentially saying that any cow that has a cell count more than, I'm suggesting 250, it could be two, it could be three, whatever you folks think is reasonable, but we'll use 250 here. We're essentially saying that a cow is a case if she's had a cell count of greater than 250, perhaps at the most recent milk recording. And once we have that, it's then possible for us to develop very simple measures of case frequency. And, and much of this is, of course, done with software nowadays, but uh, not, in, not in all countries. And so, for example, this enables us to look for patterns in time. Here, we're interested in the whole herd picture, and the black line refers to the essentially the cell count that's been uh, uh, measured in this herd over the last year. And the one previous was the cell count that was measured in the herd the season before. So that's what we see in terms of the patterns that we observe. I'll come to that in a second. The patterns that we observe, firstly, it's clearly a long, it's clearly a long term problem, but also, I think importantly, it's seasonally inconsistent. The green box refers to when house, cows are in housing. So the cows are in housing here, they're released to pasture here, and they come back into housing here. And the key thing that we'll note, <coughs> we'll note is thinking in terms of housing or the impact of housing or of pasture itself, that it is seasonally inconsistent. Secondly, uh, and uh, we're looking at the, um, uh, we're essentially looking, if we look at this central column here, and we're interested in what percentage of the herd had a cell count of greater than 250 at the most recent milk recording. A and clearly there's a massive problem, 37% of cows, but what we're really interested in as well is the pattern between different groups of animals. So we can see that with respect to lactation number, we've got high, very high percentage for older cows, but importantly, we've got worryingly high percentages for young cows as well. And then in terms of stage of lactation, we've also got high percentages regardless of the stage of lactation. So that's what we observe. And in terms of our interpretation, a major problem a problem for both young and old cows, but worse for older, and a problem at all stages of lactation. And then the last uh, uh, pattern that I'll present, uh, again, is animal groupings, but perhaps in a different way, where what we've done here, these lines, if we, if we, if we look here at this vertical axis, any, any cow that had a cell count less than 250,000 is below this line. Any cow that had a cell count greater than 250 is above. That's at the most recent recording, and this is the result at the recording before. So all of the cows here in this quadrant had cell counts that were high at the current recording, but low previously. These cows here were high both at previous and current etc. And again, well, what do the patterns tell us? Obviously very high, worryingly high percentage of cases with recent infection, but also that chronic cases are problematic and perhaps as it isn't surprising that the percentage of clear is, uh, is not very high. So our final step, before we move away from this epidemiological approach, well, what does that tell us? What clues can it tell us in terms of what's going on? Our assessment has been that the patterns are consistent within parlour spread. And that really has to do with the fact that it was seasonally inconsistent. 
that pasture and housing are unlikely, that there's a reservoir of infected mainly older cows and a reducing percentage, a worryingly reducing percentage of non-infected with younger cows at substantial risk. And that makes sense in terms of this diagram that we can see here and also that there's limited cure. So those three steps of creating the framework, looking for patterns and then interpreting those patterns with respect to clues. And clearly they can then build hypotheses for us to move forward. So step two is all of the farm activities that, that, uh, uh, th th that are important in terms of mastitis investigation. But the key thing is that the epidemiological approach undertaken first enables us to very dramatically sieve that initial information and enable us not to have to do everything. We can, for example, I think quite reasonably, focus on the parlour, in this case, and on recently infected cows. And so given that, we undertake those components of that audit-like process that are specifically relevant to this case. And then step three is, is further diagnostic testing and other examinations. And in this case, predominantly a strep uberus, uh, affecting cows of all lactation and also cows at all different stages. And uh, this, this diagram here was used uh, to help us in terms of sampling, identifying cows at various stages uh, of lactation, cows at lactation one, two, three, et cetera, and also cows that were new, were clinical and were chronic. And then the final step, um, there's clearly a need for us to focus in terms of our recommendations, in terms of what we develop, but also what we communicate. We, we obviously want to focus on those recommendations that are gonna make the greatest difference if they're enacted. So which of those are going to really help us? And uh, so, so summing it up, a predominantly strep uberus infection. Uh, I think based on the epidemiology that we could see from looking at those records in a very simple but very focused way, impala spread, older cows as the reservoir of infection, overwhelming force of infection within that parlour, and the important thing was that if we had just undertaken an audit, we probably would not have picked up that there were problems in the parlour because the impala practices were actually not too bad at all. If we'd compared them with best practice, alarm bells would not have rung. It's only because of that epidemiological understanding that we, we can be quite clear that even though parlour practices were reasonable, the force of infection from the older cows was so overwhelming that spread was occurring regardless. And the other thing was that with strep uberus, of course, it, it could be environmental, it could be associated with straw uh, or, or, or other housing, but in this particular case, the epidemiological presentation was such that we could discount that as being a possibility, certainly at this point in time. It may have been important in the past. Further analyses, uh, one of the key things I've noticed in this conference has been that a number of colleagues have presented really elegant work and introduced concepts like odds ratios, logistic regression, etc. And I think it's reasonable to ask the question, perhaps we could have done more with these, uh, at, what I've shown you at this point is very simple, could we have done more? But the problem that we face uh, in terms of investigating a single herd is that sample sizes really are too small. And if I could just illustrate this point, uh, this was a study undertaken back in the, the late 90s uh, by Scott Wells and colleagues in Minnesota. And it was very much focused on, at that time, the, emerg the, 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 uh, the emergence of Mortallaro uh, disease in the US. And, and Scott was particularly interested in understanding risk factors. And so what he did was he essentially compared two different groups of herds. He compared those that had 
more than 5% within herd prevalence, so herds with significant problems, substantial problems of mortal arrow, versus those that had none or very low levels. And this is what he found. He found, for example, that herds that had uh, lots of cows were at much greater risk than herds that had a smaller number of cows. And the important thing in terms of this logistic modelling approach is that he, he, he made that conclusion, but that's after accounting for other factors in the model. Similarly, farms that bought a lot of their animals from elsewhere were at much greater risk of having a, a mortal arrow problem versus those that didn't after accounting for these other variables. And similarly, farms that used hoof trimmers that trimmed elsewhere were at much greater risk versus farms that didn't. But the important thing is, and, and this I think is really important for, for practitioners, is Scott did his work with over 4,000 herds. We only have one in a herd investigation. So these further analyses are, um, are, are nice, but they're really very difficult in most circumstances to introduce into a, uh, into a herd problem-solving investigation. So in conclusion, just three slides to conclude the, the, the key points that I wanted to make. The first one is the importance, and I, I, I'm well aware that many practitioners do this, the importance of introducing epidemiology at the very beginning of a herd investigation, um, uh, understanding what is the issue with performance, what patterns are seen, what clues can we get, what hypotheses can we plausibly develop, that can then very much help in terms of focusing the, the, the rest of the investigation. Secondly, direct translation from the individual to the herd can be problematic. In particular, the approach of comparing what we see with best practice, because we can end up with a long list, firstly, that can vary between practitioners but then it's very difficult to know what to deal, how best to deal with it in terms of prioritising. <coughs> Epidemiological principles and methods are well understood and used routinely by many cattle vets. It's important that it's a way of thinking and that it can be extremely valuable even if data and time are limiting. And I should say that uh, this particular approach can be used uh, obviously it's not as robust, but it can be used in the absence of data as well, being sure that you ask very careful questions to understand how performance has changed in the view of the farmer, for example, over time or between different groups of animals. And lastly, epidemiological principles and methods can help to make sense of complexity, and farms are complex places, can help to focus the investigation and can assist with prioritisation and communication with farmers and, and with other colleagues as well. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I, I have to say that I myself have been inspired by some aspects, in particular of the talk, of what, what has what has struck, struck with me is just the concept that the, the understanding that I heard is much more than the sum of the individual animals. Um, we have seven minutes here that we can dedicate to, to questions and comments from the floor. Is, are there any questions? Thank you, Professor Moore. My name is Mark Burgermeister from Australia. Thank you for your discussion of diagnostic thinking. The human brain is exquisitely designed to match patterns. Can you discuss when the pattern matching goes wrong? When there's a fixation on the wrong pattern and it's hard to move to other patterns and its effect on diagnosis? Uh, thanks, Mark. I, I, I might use the example of students in the veterinary school if I could. And I, I think... Uh, I think it's really important in terms of using this approach to be quite clear that we distinguish looking for patterns, 
from interpreting clues. And in my view, it's important that we exhaust the pattern search before we then start looking for clues. If we don't, it's very easy to, to jump to conclusions based on one pattern and then seek to fit all subsequent patterns with the diagnosis that we have most high in our mind. Um, I should say that, of course, there, are, there, there will be circumstances where this, this, this uh, epidemiological approach perhaps won't help us that much. Perhaps there aren't patterns that are easily discernible, but in many cases there are. But, but the key point, I think, is, is we need to be very clear to, to, to disentangle um, th this looking for patterns from subsequently identifying clues. And, and perhaps the other thing that's important is we need to disentangle performance from activity. Uh, farmers are really keen to tell us lots about what they do, but it's important for us, I think, to get in our mind before we start discussing that, to talk through, in terms of the, for example, the, the somatic cell count, what patterns do we see? And once that's entirely clear and we've started to develop hypotheses, then, of course, it's important to understand a lot more about uh, tea dipping or uh, about milking routine or whatever. There's another question in the centre. Uh, Angus Campbell from Melbourne. Thanks for a great talk. It might have just been the example that you used, but Simon, how do you think you... I might be going on a bit from Mark's um, comment and question. Had, at that point where you've identified the, um, the distributions or those patterns and clustering, how do you avoid just using pattern recognition to spit out a, that sort of hypothesis of how it worked? It seemed to me in, in that example, you could see the, the age group clustering, but there was almost a leap of faith that was saying, I've got my disease um, propagating from my chronic cases. Are there, are there methods you can use to you know, avoid having to rely on that pattern recognition? Because it's obviously so dependent upon experience of the practitioner. I guess, uh, uh, thanks Angus. I guess the, it perhaps wasn't clear, but if I could go back a step with, with again with our students, if we go back to the individual case, we're particularly keen on a focus on structure and function because it requires deep thought and maturity of thinking as well as a very sound understanding of, of systems and functions relevant. When it comes to a herd investigation, the patterns themselves are useful, but we then need to match them with a, a really detailed understanding of the biological problem at hand. For example, I use the Dairy Australia example, but obviously we need to rely on a lot more than that. So we really, as well as we're saying, well, these are the patterns that we see. What does that tell us that can help us to better understand um, the, the processes that are occurring? Um, our deep understanding of mastitis in all its guises. So, so it's only one part of the picture, um, but we need to be careful I guess that one, we don't seek to put a square peg into a round hole, but just that that can help inform where we next go. Uh, I'd see myself, I'd see epidemiology as taking us only so far down the route. Um, it, it helps us to, helps us to distill in terms of a sieve, but then our clinical skills take us from that point forward. So, so that's, I don't know if that's helpful. There's a question at the, at the very back. Thank you. Um, my name is Jocelyn Zbuk. I I'm from Canada. I'd like to know your thoughts about, um, you know, when we do these herd level investigations, um, we're looking at risk factors, but when, if we want to do good evidence-based medicine, when we look in the literature, most of these studies are done at the cow level, right? And so you have a mastitis problem or a herd somatic cell count problem, but you turn around and all you have or most of what you have is cow level data risk factors. So what do you think 
how could the industry improve and produce more her level studies? I, I, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. I guess the, but perhaps I'll try and answer and you tell me if I, if I have. In terms of a herd investigation, I, I guess it, it really depends on the, the investigation that's undertaken, but generally you're comparing, for example, different cows within a herd and you're looking for patterns between cows. So in that way, you're interested in cow level risk factors. When we look at the literature, we need to be clear about whether the literature is informing us about herd level risk factors or cow level risk factors. But both of them can be important and can help to inform our thinking with respect to the problem that we have at hand. But certainly, uh, 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 herd problem solving, we're working within, generally within a single herd or perhaps within a group of herds. I'd like to thank Simon. Um, for his inspiring talk. We have to move on to our next speaker. Dr.